Can vitamin B12 and folate help detoxify oxalate? This may explain why high-dose biotin causes oxalate dumping symptoms in some people, but not others. Last week, I had two consulting clients who reported having to cut back on high-dose biotin, in these cases, in excess of 10 milligrams per day, because it was causing oxalate dumping sy symptoms, including crystals exuding from the skin in one case and from the eyes in another. In the comments on a previous article of mine, Can Biotin Help Detoxify Oxalate?, David Barker, MD, reported that low-dose biotin eliminated oxalate-related symptoms. This is a quote from him. Muscle spasms that have plagued me for six months were gone by day two. Exercise tolerance and energy level have improved dramatically. Dude, you are onto something. Everything else in my diet has been exactly the same. I eat the exact same low oxalate diet every day and I measure everything down to the gram. The only change in my regimen has been adding 75 micrograms per day of biotin initially, now up to 225 micrograms per day in three divided doses. Dude, I really think you are onto something. End quote. Together with the comments I highlighted in my original article from Jen P. and Caddy Girlio, suggesting that oxalate dumping symptoms can be elicited from 2 milligrams per day in some people and, in 10 mil and with 10 milligrams per day but not 5 milligrams per day in others, these stories collectively suggest that biotin may have an extremely context-dependent ability to eliminate or elicit oxalate-related symptoms with a dose dependency that is widely variable between individuals. My suspicion is that if biotin causes dumping symptoms instead of eliminating them, this is because the first step in the putative detoxification of oxalate is exceeding the capacity of the second step. Recall from my previous article, podcast, and video about biotin being able to detoxify oxalate, my proposed two-step detoxification process. Before we get going, I just want to let you know that I have a free gift for you. That is my MTHFR protocol, a seven-page quick guide to optimizing and personalizing your methylation status using foods and supplements. My MTHFR protocol is free to anyone who subscribes to my Substack, whether free or paid. Use chrismasterjohnphd.com slash MTHFR or use the first link in the description. Enter your email, click subscribe, and you will immediately get a welcome email in your inbox that contains my MTHFR protocol as a downloadable PDF. I hope you find your free gift useful and enjoy it. Once again, that's chrismasterjohnphd.com slash MTHFR. Step 1. Pyruvate carboxylate converts oxalate to formate. Step 2. Formate is joined to tetrahydrofolate to enter the methylation cycle or be used for the synthesis of purines or for the synthesis of DNA or be converted to carbon dioxide and exhaled in the breath. I now further propose that when the rate of the first step exceeds the rate of the second, oxalate dumping symptoms are precipitated in a five-step process. One, at first, Circulating oxalate concentrations are reduced because the oxalate converts to formate and then becomes joined to folate. Step 2. The lowered concentration of circulating oxalate elicits a dissolution of calcium oxalate crystals. This is a result of Le Chatelier's principle. Assume the reversible reaction calcium plus oxalate makes calcium oxalate crystals, and this is a reversible process. If this reaction is at equilibrium and then the concentration of oxalate is reduced, the equilibrium shifts leftward to favor the dissolution of the calcium oxalate crystals. Step 3. If the pyruvate carboxylase reaction proceeded indefinitely to formate, there would be a net drainage of crystals without the oxalate ever rising back to the original equilibrium concentration. However, if the utilization of formulated folate becomes limited, then the concentration of formate rises. This reduces the rate at which oxalate is converted to formate through Le Chatelier's principle. For the reaction, oxalate interconverts with formate and CO2, an increase in formate shifts the equilibrium leftward. The concentration of oxalate now rises again, and this reverses the equilibrium shift that occurred in step two. This, for formation, this favors the reformation of oxalate crystals. That's the fourth step. And then five, the crystals may now deposit wherever they wind up, with the net result of all five steps 
being a mobilization and redeposition of the crystals. Perhaps in some cases, these exude through the skin or the mucous membranes, as reported by two of my clients. There may be more regulation layered on top of this to prevent excessive formate accumulation. It would certainly be preferable to have oxalate crystals cause pain or disrupt the skin than to have formate accumulate beyond the capacity to clear it. Formate accumulation is the principal mechanism of methanol toxicity. Part of its toxicity is driven by inhibiting cytochrome oxidase, complex four of the mitochondrial respiratory chain, which would inhibit the clearance of sulfite and hydrogen sulfide and block the production of ATP. Nourishing the first step of oxalate detoxification, according to my model, requires biotin and manganese. Nourishing the second step requires, above all else, a sufficient amount of tetrahydrofolate, or THF. This is the unmethylated form of folate. The first This, first of all, requires having enough folate. It also requires having enough B12 because B12 removes the methyl group from 5-methyl-THF to regenerate THF. Formate is joined to THF using the enzyme MTHFD1, which has a common polymorphism, RS... (coughs) Excuse me. RS... Choking on my own speaking. RS222... Excuse me. RS2236225, where the risk allele has an A where each copy reduces the rate of the enzyme by 22%. This enzyme depends on magnesium ATP and is activated by potassium. This forms 10 formal THF, which has four principal fates. It can be used for purine synthesis, it can be used in methylation, it can be used in DNA synthesis, or it can be converted to carbon dioxide, which we exhale in our breath. 10 formal THF can be used in a series of 10 reactions to synthesize purines, which make up half the building blocks in our DNA and which make up the base of important energy carriers such as ATP and the derivatives of niacin and riboflavin, NADH, NADPH, and FADH2. This pathway requires the amino acids aspartate, glutamine, and glycine, and it requires magnesium ATP, carbon dioxide, five carbon sugars made in the pentose phosphate pathway, and enzymes that depend on iron, sulfur, and potassium. The pathway will be most active on a low purine diet, such as would be prescribed for gout. The use of 10 formal folate in methylation requires two more sequential reactions using MTHFD1, using electrons and energy carried by niacin in the form of NADPH taken from glucose in the pentose phosphate pathway. The pentose phosphate pathway in turn requires thiamine, calcium, and magnesium, and the enzyme glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, an impairment of which is the most common genetic defect in the world. These reactions form 5,10-methylene tetrahydrofolate, or 5,10-methylene THF, which the enzyme MTHFR, the mother gene, converts to 5-methyl-THF using riboflavin and yet more NADPH carrying electrons and energy from the pentose phosphate pathway. The enzyme methionine synthase then uses vitamin B12 to move the methyl group from 5-methyl-THF to homocysteine, forming methionine. Finally, the methionine is activated using energy and adenosine from magnesium ATP, and the enzyme methionine adenosyl transferase. The resulting S-adenosyl methionine is then used for any hundreds of methylation reactions. Now, I just described the formation of 5,10-methylene THF from 10-formal THF in the context of being used for methylation, but an alternative use of 5,10-methylene THF is to synthesize thymidylate, an intermediate in the synthesis of thymidine, one of the four bases used in DNA, the one designated T. This pathway is blocked by antifolate medications such as methotrexate used as chemotherapy or as immunosuppressive drugs for autoimmune diseases. The folate-mediated portion of this pathway requires the enzymes thymidylate synthase, dihydrofolate reductase, and serine hydroxymethyltransferase, which in turn, that last enzyme, depends on vitamin B6 as well as the amino acid serine. More broadly, thymidine synthesis depends on magnesium ATP and NADPH from the pentose phosphate pathway and will be tied to the synthesis of other DNA bases with similar requirements for magnesium ATP and NADPH, making magnesium ATP and NADPH central in the overall utilization of the pathway and its regulation. Finally, the fourth fate of 10-formal folate is to make CO2 when we don't need it for any other purpose. And this is done with the enzymes aldehyde dehydrogenase 1 and 2, which oxidize the formal group of 10-formal THF and release it as CO2, which we exhale in our breath. 
These enzymes require riboflavin in the form of FAD, niacin in the form of NAD+, or NADP+, magnesium, and iron. All right. If biotin causes oxalate dumping symptoms at a dose that exceeds the dose needed for maximal benefit of whatever else the biotin is being used for, the most rational starting place is to cut back on the dose of biotin. Why do something that's causing harm if you don't need it for any benefit? However, I would look next at deficiencies that could limit the second step of my proposed system of oxalate detoxification. Chief among these would be the supply of tetrahydrofolate, or THF, which is best assessed with urinary formaminoglutamate, or FIGLU. FIGLU is specifically a marker of the availability of THF rather than the availability of formal formulated folate or methyl, methylated folate or methylated folate, which the other markers of folate metabolism are designed to look for. However, the full and urinary figlu would be on an organic acid test. However, the full scope of nutrient status is the test for is thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, B6, folate, which we just talked about, B12, calcium, magnesium, iron, sulfur, and potassium. There's 11 key nutrients. On top of that, ATP is featured ubiquitously throughout all aspects of the second step. So any limitation of energy metabolism could be catastrophic to the second step, regardless of the status of the above nutrients. Such limitations could be caused by many nutrient deficiencies or toxins. While I've often said that they could be caused by common metabolic impairments such as disorders of the thyroid or adrenals or diabetes, I'm increasingly thinking that these disorders are far more likely to be effects rather than causes of problems with energy metabolism. Common contributors would be overweight and obesity, junk food, indoor sedentary lifestyles, and toxic environments, while rare contributors would be the hundreds of different idiosyncratic bottlenecks in energy metabolism caused by rare genetic mutations. And while having a diagnosable disease due to a homozygous status for one of these mutations is exceedingly rare on its own, although not so rare collectively, because if you take 1,400 diseases that have 1 in 100,000 incidents, they collectively are 1.4% of people. That's just a number giving you not, that's not an exact number. That's just a number giving you an idea of how a lot of things that are exceedingly rare collectively are actually not that rare. But having heterozygous status for one or more of these hundreds of different disorders is collectively common and does affect metabolism in almost every case known. The role of ATP in the putative second step of oxalate detoxification is one small subset of everything. And as I've written recently and as I've made a video about, energy metabolism governs everything. Thus, the low-hanging fruit of this problem is to eat a healthy diet, get good exercise, both of those in proportions that lead to healthy body composition, get outdoor sunlight, take reasonable precautions against common toxins like filtering your water, minimizing plastic, and so on, and then finally to avoid doses of biotin that provoke oxalate dumping symptoms. The fruit a little further up on the tree is to use information such as my Vitamins and Minerals 101 or my Vitamins and Minerals 101 Cliff Notes both of which are free to MasterPass members, and the Vitamins and Minerals 101 without the premium features is free to everyone. And to make sure the diet is an optimal, use these to make sure the optim, diet is an optimal source of micronutrients. So the lowest hanging fruit is just to assume that if you do everything right in a very general sense, everything will fall into place. A little bit up further on the tree than that is to actually test things and, and manage them in a way that gives you more assurance that things are in the right place. The fruit midway up the tree is to do nutritional status testing with an emphasis on thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, B6, folate, B12, calcium, magnesium, iron, sulfur, and potassium. And those would best be done with my testing nutritional status, the ultimate cheat sheet, which is free to master pass members. And if you go to the description, you can click on the link to the original version of what I'm giving you now, which was a written article on Substack. And in that article, you will find my recommendations for comprehensive testing for nutritional status, the interpretation of which is in the cheat sheet. But the links to what I would describe as the best test to get are all in the written version of this on Substack. The highest hanging fruit is to identify individual bottlenecks in energy metabolism that may be limiting the process. For more information on that, see the written version of this on Substack or head over to my podcast and video, Energy Metabolism Governs Everything. I can help with 
analyzing your genome from a whole genome sequencing raw data file and the reports given. I prefer Dante Labs. If you book a consultation with me, I need help. And I can also help with all those interpretation of all those labs. Oxalate is a metabolic toxin that decreases the activity of the citric acid cycle by up to 48%. And formate is a respiratory chain poison. While we're on the topic of the mitochondria, don't forget to join me on the Mitochondrial Energy Summit. I'll provide links for that as well in the description. Have you experienced any oxalate-related issues when taking biotin, or have you found any other nutrients discussed here to help with oxalate-related symptoms? If so, let me know in the comments. Hope this was helpful, and I'll see you next time. Before you go, I just want to remind you one more time that I have a free gift for you. That is my MTHFR protocol, a seven-page quick guide to optimizing and personalizing your methylation status using foods and supplements. My MTHFR protocol is free to anyone who subscribes to my substack, whether free or paid. Use chrismasterjohnphd.com slash mthfr or use the first link in the description. Enter your email, click subscribe, and you will immediately get a welcome email in your inbox that contains my MTHFR protocol as a downloadable PDF. I hope you enjoy your free gift and find it useful. Once again, that's chrismasterjohnphd.com slash mthfr. See you next time.